I'd just like to welcome everybody who's um, joined us today for our How to Build a Human Meet the Human Cell Atlas member Q&A session. Um, my name is Susie O'Hara and I'm the project curator for the public engagement project that runs alongside the Human Cell Atlas UK project. Um, it's funded by the Wellcome Trust and involves a number of institutions um, across the UK from Newcastle, London, Oxford and Cambridge. Um, How to Build a Human Design a Card Game Challenge is our, um, is our school's challenge project which runs over the, the next few months um, and the deadline is the 1st of April and we're here today to hear a little bit more about that challenge and also to invite um, some of the members from across those partner institutions to tell us a little bit more about what they do, who they are, what their job is, and how their job relates to developing the human cell atlas knowledge. Um, after we hear from all of the scientists, what we're gonna do is open the floor over to you guys, and you'll have a chance to ask any questions that you might have to the scientists about their work. And we'll also then have a chance for you to talk, uh, to ask questions about our challenge um, to Dominic and also to Ellie Burkhead from Little Inventors who are joining us here on the call as well. So what we're gonna do is kick off with Dominic Wilcox, who's founder and chief inventor from Little Inventors and our lead collaboration uh, collaborator on the How to Build Human Schools Challenge. Over to you, Dominic. Thank you, Susie. Um, yes, I'm Dominic Wilcox, artist, designer and inventor and also founder of Little Inventors and at Little Inventors we challenge people to think of invention ideas or designs. Uh, they could be bonkers or perfectly practical and then we challenge, challenge experts with skills to bring to life the most interesting ideas. And in this case, we've teamed up with the, um, the Human Cell Atlas to come up with this challenge. And the challenge is to take inspiration from the Human Cell Atlas and also your existing knowledge of human cells and tissues to come up with a card game. And that card game should have some sort of educational part to it. So it can be fun, but it, but it, Ideally, it's a game that if someone plays it, they would learn something about the human cell atlas um, or human cells. So I'm going to just show you a little bit of the website and I'm going to share my screen. Here we go. Share. Uh, so as some of you may have visited, so it's hca.littleinventors.org and here's the this is the home page but then if we click on to the challenge you can see this is the place where the challenge is laid out um so the how to build a human card game challenge a little bit of information about the challenge here there's a video to watch an introduction um, about this challenge which was introduced by me um, you can download the entry pack and the resource pack. So this is the this is the stuff that will help you come up with your your idea, and help you think of ideas. And also, it's got the entry sheets that you need to fill in, and upload to little to the hca.littleinventors.org website here um, to enter into the challenge. So the first activity we've got here is the introduction and this is about what what the human cell atlas is about and actually anna is going to talk about that later next um, we've got a little bit of information well actually we've got lots of information and lots of videos from human cell atlas researchers that you can you can watch we put them on youtube so you can learn all about the different parts of the project um, which is fascinating and we're lucky we've got a note we've got some researchers on this call um, right now who we're going to hear from later and then once you've learned as much as you can about the human cell atlas you then need to come up with a game now we've teamed up with Richard Hayes who is an expert game designer that is a real job you can get a job as a game designer 
and Richard's got that job and he there's a video there with lots of information about how to come up with card games which is fascinating I recommend everybody watch that and has a go um, then yeah we've got to, then after you've you've learned a bit about how to come up with card games then you want to apply that to coming up with a game taking inspiration from the eighth human cell atlas and human cells and coming up with a game um, we've got some sheets that you need to fill in there are four sheets or three main sheets one is to draw your box card the game box uh, cover so that would have like an illustration of of your game's theme and maybe your title of your game. And then we've got a sheet on the right corner there, which is to give us some examples of cards. So Richard needs to understand what your idea is. You don't need to create a full game. You just need to create an idea for a game and communicate what the rules are, how do you play it, etc., etc. So these sheets do that. And then you press en enter and I'll just show you just quickly before we move on, um, an example of an entry. So you go over to the see the ideas, scroll down. We've got this one, Celebinos by Ava, Lily, Annie, and Emily. Now you can enter this project in a team, which 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 is great. Working together is great with uh, coming up with ideas. Or you can come at, you can enter it individually, if the, if that's the way it needs to be, and. Um, so yes, so we've got a competitive educational card game for all the family, a race to get rid of all your cards and create a visual representation of our human anatomy. Now you can up, so that's the card game cover. And then we've got, these are the designs for the card games, really well illustrated. We love that, fantastic. And then the other sheet is basically, this is describe the rules of your game, you know, what do the players do on their turn? There's lots of details to discuss and write down, communicate as much as you can. And, and that is the challenge website. So check that out, have a go. It's really good fun on a really interesting subject, the Human Cell Atlas. Um, so now- right. I, I, So before you go, Dominic, uh, I'm going to, after your talk, I'd like to, to do a poll because I've seen that more people have entered the room and welcome to everybody who's joined us here. So after Dominic's talk, I just want to launch this poll here. Has this come on the screen? Yep, that's great. This is the first time I've done a poll using Zoom. So I'm quite excited. Fantastic. It seems like we're well familiar with card games, which is fantastic. So it would be really interesting. Perhaps people could share maybe their favorite card game in the in the chat box if they can uh, if they if they're happy to. Please do share your favorite card game. And while you do that, we'll introduce Anna Wilbury Clark from the Sanger Institute down in Cambridge. We'll let you kick off, Anna. Hello, so I'm Anna, I'm at Sanger in Cambridge. So I'm one of the wet lab scientists who works on human cell atlas. So that means I'm one of the people that works in the lab. You can see my lab. Um, and I work with the cells and the tissues and the chemicals and all that kind of stuff. So I've got literally like four slides that I'll just share with you about what the human cell atlas is. And then I will um, give you a, a two minute overview of what I do. So, can people see slides? Thumbs up if you can see slides. Yeah. So basically what we're aiming to do at the Human Cell Atlas is we're aiming to discover all the cell types in your body and where they're located. And the way that we do this is by, we are looking at what genes are turned on in different cells. And we hope that the information that we're going to get from this project will help us to better understand ourselves. So it'll help us to understand our biology. It'll also help us to then understand what goes wrong when there are diseases. And it'll also help us understand how we could develop uh, therapeutics, how we can develop medicines against different diseases. I apologize. I always have to move you guys wherever I put you. 
you're always in the wrong place. So we are aiming to build a Google map of the human body, basically. So if you go to Google Maps, you will be able to look at a country and then you will be able to zoom into the street and then down to an individual house that you might want to see. With the human cell atlas, the idea would be that we will be able to look at the whole human body and then you'll be able to zoom in so that you can look at different organs in the body and then go right down to the level of looking at the individual cells and the structures and how those cells are arranged within the in that organ within the body and also to look at what genes are expressed in those cells. So there are around 37 trillion cells in your body, which is a lot of cells. And we are studying most of the different tissue types in your body, cells and tissues in your body. So the picture that you can see here shows you the different, some of the different organs in your body and highlighted are the ones that we're studying. So I think that's probably most of the different organs you would think of. So we are trying to understand what cells those different organs contain. We're trying to understand how they change across your life. And we're trying to build a reference map of a healthy human being and what we look like at the cellular level. So that will be useful then to compare against disease states to understand what changes when you get a disease. And for the Key Stage 3 students, so this competition is being aimed at Key Stage 3. And at that age, I think you guys should be learning about what cells are. So hopefully this should be quite relevant to you. You should also be learning a bit about what DNA is and what genes are. You will probably want to understand how cells are different. So you might think about that in terms of how cells differ in their shape or their size or their color, or in terms of what they do, their function. We at the Human Cell Atlas are also interested in understanding what genes are turned on in different cell types. And that's how we mainly uh, kind of decide what different cell types are different. So that's how we define different cell types. Cells are building blocks of tissues and organs. So I think that's quite important to understand. And the thing that I'm quite interested in really is how cells then fit together in 3D space and how cells kind of work together to form structures within tissues and organs. So if I just stop sharing. So with respect to what I do, so I don't really work on any one tissue. I work much more broadly, but I am very interested in, as I said, how cells fit together in structures within organs. And so if you think of an organ, it's not just like a big bag of cells that where the cells float around inside, they all have structures. And it's quite interesting when you kind of cut through an organ and look at the structures inside, you'll see how the cell types fit together and they have to fit together in particular ways so that cell types that need to work together might need to be, they might need to be right next to each other. They might need to form structures like membranes that stop different chemicals passing through. They might need to be close together because they might make a chemical that a cell type close by needs to receive so they can talk to each other. So I'm interested in how the cells fit together in space in order to do their jobs, basically. And the way that I do that is by taking really thin um, sections, really thin slices through tissues. So they're less than the thickness of a human hair. And then I apply stains to them, which look at what genes are expressed in different cell types and allow me to look at what cells are located in different places in tissues. Um, and it's really beautiful actually, um, when you look at these. And if you even think of a structure that I was working on last year as the esophagus and I just thought of that as a tube that goes from your mouth down to your stomach, to be honest. Um, but actually, when you look at it, it's actually much more intricate and complicated. It's, it's a really beautiful structure with lots of different cell types in. And you look at those structures and you can see how the different cells are arranged to do their jobs. And it's really fascinating. So that's what I like doing. And I think that'd be really interesting in a game as well, if there's a way to incorporate that in a game. So I think that covers a bit about the human startless and a bit about me. So perhaps if I pass on to Alexi now. Hello there. Hi, I'm Alexi Staffer, um, and I'm actually not a scientist. Um, I'm a software developer working um, for the HCA. Um, and so oh, I spent my, all my other jobs have been creating like client apps for stationary companies to track the number of staplers they have in their warehouse or like their applications for financial institutions. Um, 
to take money from people and that's very boring and doesn't really further the human endeavor very much so the human sell out list uh, is, a, is a great opportunity for me to use those skills in, in a way that can really help um, everybody um, and so I work at the, the EBI the European Bioinformatics Institute um, in the ingest team for HCA and we're the team of support bioinformaticians who are scientists and and data sort of almost sort of split between software developer and scientists um, so they know the data practices that we need um, and other software developers and user experience specialists and with but our team is, is basically trying to build the the portal the sort of front door for scientists to, to enter their information into the, the human cell atlas um, and so at the moment they do that via like conversations they have over email with the support by informaticians and where our goal is to make a, you know, a website and an experience that, that they don't have to do that. And that, that, that opens up the, the volume of um, what we can accept in the HCA to the entire planet. Um, and so, um, and what's interesting about the, the Human Soundless project um, sort of, as I understand it, um, is the, the, the quality of the data that we have about, um, about the sequences and about the collection is of much higher degree. And so it's actually more work than some scientists are used to doing when, when they're submitting information. Um, so that means that we have to have better sort of techniques for sort of guiding people through and spotting mistakes. And that's been the sort of biggest problem that um, me and my team have been facing um, while I've been working here. Um, and so what I was going to show you um, is a sneak peek at what we've been doing so far. So, um, so this is our, um, so currently this is being used by our wranglers, uh, who are our support by informaticians who sort of help the scientists get the data through. Um, and um, and so, and they're acting as you know, sort of our proxy end users um, for when we actually release this publicly. Um, and so, so here we have, you know, a nice, hopefully nice welcoming help page. Um, and like the process of like registering a project should be hopefully fairly easy. We should have, you know, descriptions over the side here that help the, the scientists understand why we need that information and what we're going to use it for. Um, and, you know, tracking errors and that kind of thing. Um, so and I found a project that it seems like it'd be interesting to show you here. So, so here we have a, a, a project from, from a scientist and um, you know, we have the, the description of the project. It's all about you know, collecting lots of different liver cells. So, um, uh, and so the previous speaker was, um, uh, was, was talking about how the, the collection of cells, you know, that's what's the really interesting thing, the structures that are being made. And we can see that, that this is all about liver cells. Um, and so, and, and here we can see like, here's a list of all the, the the, the samples, so that'll be the sequences, um, which can have lots of, a sample can have lots of sequences. And like, here's the protocols, right, which is like the, the, the experimental description. So how did you go and get those? What, what bits of science did you do to go and get the sequence information? Um, and then, you know, you'll submit that with your data files, which is your, your A's, T's, C's and G's. Um, and, and then um, once that's all submitted through the system, it can be added into the atlas and then we can you know, get you know, big servers to go and get all of the information of all the sequences for example of all the liver experiments and then go and do further analysis and that's where really interesting stuff happens so um so that's a bit about me and what i've been doing that's fantastic alexi thank you so much a completely different role in the human cell atlas to what anna has talked about which is fascinating thank so you. now i'd like to progress to laura jardine who I believe is zooming in from Newcastle. Is that correct? Yes, hello. Um, I might look like I'm on some sort of fluorescent planet, but no, I'm in Newcastle. Um, I'm a medical doctor and um, I work in the lab as well. Um, and my interest is in blood and immune cells and how they develop from the stem cells that make them. So I think that this is particularly amazing because there are only around 30,000 stem cells that supply the billions and billions of blood cells we need throughout life. Um, so I'm interested in them in a scientist, from a scientist point of view, but also from a doctor, because um, we treat people who've got um, cancers of the bone marrow and problems with their bone marrow, and we treat them with stem cell transplant. Um, and this can be a life-saving treatment for people. And it's a one that 
sometimes goes well and sometimes has problems. And we don't really know enough about the science of stem cells and about how we can use that to make people better. So at the minute I'm working on um, the blood and the bone marrow before a baby is born. Um, the developmental hematopoiesis is the long word for it. Um, and that's a really interesting time because it's a period where the whole blood and immune system is created. And we know that these stem cells before birth have huge power to sort of regenerate. So the work with, that I'm doing with the um, Human Cell Atlas is trying to learn more about these stem cells and think about how we can apply them to transplantation therapies in the future. Gosh, thank you so much, Laura. That's absolutely fantastic. And so different again, um, to kind of move from bioinformatics to transplantation is a, is a, is a big leap and really interesting. I'm going to move on to Sid Lawrence now. Sid, do you want to tell us where you're zooming in from? Yeah, thanks, Susie. I'm, I'm uh, zooming in from Cambridge. Um, I'm also medical, uh, like uh, our last speaker, but I'm a, a surgical doctor and I'm an orthopedic surgeon. So that means uh, bones and joints. And so the part of the human cell atlas I'm interested in is the joint. And if you think about a joint that look down at your knee or something like that, it's basically two big bones uh, covered at their ends in cartilage, which is an amazing uh, substance that allows the bones, if you think of yourself running or cycling, it allows those bones to sort of move on each other with pretty much close to zero friction. And if you think of how much weight is going through your knee when you're running, uh, that's quite an incredible achievement. Um, and so what I'm interested in is how uh, cartilage cells um, are, are grown really in, in the developing human, again, from these stem cells. Um, and, if, and then thinking how we can use that information uh, as a sort of cookbook. And that cookbook can be uh, applied to trying to grow these cells in a laboratory and that's really useful for uh, lots of reasons one you can sort of study these cells in different environments to try and understand diseases that affect cartilage like arthritis and then also maybe in the future if we can grow really uh, lifelike cartilage cells in a dish we might be able to somehow use that to treat diseases that affect cartilage, um, which of course is pretty miserable because it means you can't um, move very easily. And sometimes movement can be very painful and really affect people's quality of life. So it's a really exciting thing to be working on, trying to understand how uh, healthy human development can maybe uh, in the future help us treat uh, disease and illness. Thank you so much, Sid. That's really interesting and a really useful explanation of the application of this kind of research in real world settings. I think that's really fantastic. I'm going to put a call out to any questions that people have. Feel free to put them in the chat. Um, we have another two um, scientists who are going to give a, an explanation on what they're doing for the Human Cell Atlas and then we'll go on to your questions after that. We've had a few coming through. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Clarice Garnier to talk about her research. Where are you zooming in from, Clarice? I'm zooming from London. So hi, everyone. I'm Clarice Garnier. Uh, I work at the Center for Stem Cell and Regenerative Medicine at King's College London. And uh, my particular interest uh, within the Human Cell Atlas is the skin. Actually, I have a couple of slides, if I can share them, is that all right? There we go. Let's remove our face. So uh, I don't know if that looks uh, familiar to you, but this is uh, the skin. So this is the skin uh, that you all can see. This is the really uh, the largest organ in your body and a really, really important one because it helps you to protect your body uh, against the environment, against the infection, dehydration, that's a really, really important organ. And uh, something that is 
uh, kind of really cool to work with also because that's uh, easy to get. So uh, my particular topic is to understand how cells are organized within your skin and uh, not only uh, a particular area in your skin, but in different area, because you know, this is the largest body, uh, this is the largest organ in your body, and the skin is actually really different from different areas. So if you can see here, uh, this is one of the typical images of skin with here the epidermis, so the, the first layer of the skin that you can all see and below the dermis, so all of that is the dermis. And I don't know if you can see, but all the little dots here are your cells. Here it's the skin that we're extracting from uh, an abdomen individual. So this is, this is from a particular area. If you look different area, so as you can see here, the skin uh, doesn't really look the same. There is a lot of difference uh, in terms of, especially the little structure that you can see here, actually here, that we call the air follicle. Sorry, just realized you couldn't see my mouse. Because you have really much hair on the face. Uh, the, the skin on the face is also a bit more sweaty. A, this is not exactly the same. So there is a lot of differences that were not that studied before. So this is my main focus. Understand how the cells within the skin are organized, what are the function, and how the role and the function differ between body sites. And another um, big difference is that is noticeable within the skin is the blood vessel. So you know you have blood vessel all over your body because this is to aliment your organ. So you also have blood vessel that go to the to your skin to bring uh, nutrients and all immune cells or all the the cell communication or, or nutrients that your skin could need. And actually, this network is also really different among uh, anatomical sites. So if you can see here, this is different uh, anatomical sites. So here, the body and here, the face. And you can see here, this is a representation of your blood vessel. And this is really, really different in terms of the organization, the size, uh, the density, the structure. And that is also something we're trying to understand using the human cell atlas and using all the tools we have at the single cell level. So this Brilliant. is uh, what I do. Yeah. Thank you so much, Clarice. That's fantastic. We're getting lots of really interesting questions in the chat as well. So I'm really excited to, um, to get to, to uh, asking some questions to you guys too. But not before we hear from Michael Mather. Um, Michael, very, very delighted to have you here. And I'm wondering if you could tell us where you're zooming in from. Yes, so um, like Laura, I'm zooming from Newcastle. Um, yes, so, uh, and like Sid, I'm a surgical uh, doctor, um, but our interest is in problems with the ear, nose and throat. Um, and in particular, we're quite interested in ear infections and uh, getting buildup of fluid behind the eardrum. Uh, so we know that this is a really uh, common problem. And in fact, that buildup of fluid behind the eardrum is the most common uh, reversible cause of hearing loss uh, in children. Um, but actually, we don't understand really a great deal why that happens. You know, some people. Um, get one episode and it gets better and then other people get it again and again and we don't really know why but um, we suspect that it's to do with something called the adenoids which is a bit like if you know about your tonsils at the back of your mouth your adenoids are basically like tonsils at the back of the nose so they're kind of like nose tonsils and they're full of cells which uh, detect bacteria and viruses and tell your body that it's under attack um, and we think that uh, and others uh, think that this uh, buildup of fluid and infections in the ear is probably due to too much stimulation of this adenoid tissue at the back of the nose. Uh, and so our main project is uh, looking at um, uh, uh, describing the different uh, infection fighting cells in this adenoid tissue, um, comparing uh, patients with uh, these fluid buildups in the ear and those who don't have that. Um, yeah. 
Thank you so much, Michael. What a fabulous kind of jaunt around the human body. Holy moly, from the inside out. That's absolutely fantastic. Michael, while we've got you on, we have a question from Marty. Um, using stem scales, excuse me, I'll say that again. Using stem cells, would it be possible to construct parts of the body, such as eardrums? Yeah, I mean, that's a really great question. Um, so in, in talking of ears, um, eardrums, so some of the operations we do are rebuilding eardrums. But actually what we do is we borrow bits of tissue from elsewhere in the body. So usually sort of bits of scalp, we borrow little bits of that and, and sort of reshape it and use that to rebuild the eardrum. But actually it would be much better if we didn't have to go and take tissue from other places and could just grow it and put it straight in. So that that's, you know, I think that's where the future is and that's a really great question. Um, people have already used stem cells to um, develop what we call grafts, so sort of um, developed uh, cells, if you like, um, to put behind the eardrum uh, in people who've had lots of infections and uh, problem, problems like that behind the eardrum to kind of reconstruct it. Um, so yes, but actual stem cells to reconstruct the eardrum hasn't been done yet, but you know, watch the space, that would be a great place to, to go. That's maybe one for Marty when he gets into being a scientist potentially. Absolutely. <laughs> we have another question and maybe um, and this can be open to anybody. What is the smallest cell in the human body? I see the thinking caps are on. <laughs> I'm going to go on to the next one and give you kind of time to think, maybe, on that one. I'll be the red blood cells, guys. Red blood cells? Maybe a platelet if you count that as a cell. That's yeah, I was, I was debating, do you count it as a cell or not? Mm -hmm. are, are sperm big or, or the small, biggest or smallest? I can't remember. Over, over. Yeah, I think sperm are very small, aren't they? Are they not very small? I can't remember. Yeah, they might be, actually. Another question would be, what's your favorite cell? Who wants to pick that up, Anna? My favorite, well, it depends what I'm working on at the time. At the moment, um, probably because I'm working on lungs and we have uh, kind of, we discover new cell types and that. So um, one of my colleagues discovered cells called ionocytes. Well, they were discovered independently by a couple of different groups and they're cells that express cystic fibrosis gene. So I think that's really interesting. So new Laura? cell types are always discovering. Anybody else? Um, I, I really like megakaryocytes. So they are the um, cells that make platelets. So platelets swim around in your bloodstream and they're what stops you from bleeding if you cut yourself. They form a plug and fill a gap. But they're made from megakaryocytes, which are these big chunky cells that sit in your bone marrow and they just shred themselves into platelets. I think that's pretty cool. And they also look good. Brilliant. Anyone else? Favourite cell? I think probably neutrophils, you know, eating bacteria, that's pretty cool. Amazing. We have a question for Alexi on a different note. Alexa, Alexi, you, you talked about the fact that you worked in a very different sector before joining the Human Cell Atlas. Um, why did you decide to work in science instead of your old job? Um, I'd been looking for something that sort of suited my um, sort of moral beliefs if that makes sense like in software development it's very easy to fall into something like um a google or a facebook or an apple you know these big software companies that you know don't necessarily know what they're doing right you know facebook is this thing that sort of just grew and grew and grew and you know we're only starting to understand the impacts of that and that's you know ways that software can form the world and um, yeah, and some of those experiences working in finance, you should, you know, in finance and stuff like that, and in startup culture, um, I just wanted to do something with my skills that felt helpful, rather than like always looking over my back to see like, oh, what, you know, what, what, what have I done to the world or something. Um, and and you know, it, it, it's a, it's a you know, it, it, unlike in some you know, moral choices you make when you're making jobs, you know, if you want to be a teach, teacher, you have to accept a lesser salary and all that sort of thing. It's not the case in science, thankfully. Like it, it was, it was competitive in that way. So, so you know, once I saw the opportunity and was able to get the job, it was like a dream come true for me. 
Brilliant. Thank you very much. Michael, we have another question for, me, for you. Why would some doctors remove adenoids even if the person has also had grommets due to an ear infection? Oh, yes, yeah, so that, that's, that's a really good question. So, um, yeah, a lot of the time people do just get grommets. Um, that's true. Um, <clears throat> there, there is uh, some data to suggest that having the adenoids removed as well um, in selected patients uh, can help uh, two things. One, increase the amount of time that uh, grommets sort of work for, um, and uh, two, reduce the chances of the glute ear coming back. Um, the guidelines at the moment are that not everyone who has these ear problems gets the adenoids removed. A lot of them just get grommets, but if they have trouble with the nose as well, like nasal blockage and things like that, um, then that might be an indication to get the adenoids removed as well. But the, the, the um, sort of information about this is changing all the time because actually the way that adenoids are removed is changing and actually the way that's done now is a lot safer using different techniques to compare to even a few years ago. So it's a, a, a rapidly evolving area. So it's changing all the time. But you're right, most people just get grommets, absolutely. Right, thank you so much. We have a number of doctors who are also scientists here. And a question that I have is, um, how does your work as a doctor affect your work as a scientist and vice versa? Maybe Laura, do you wanna pick that one or Sid? Um, so first of all, my work as a doctor makes me completely biased as a scientist. Um, and that, that's, that's why I study blood and bone marrow because that's what my clinical specialty is. Um, but I think that it gives me a sort of a reason to do it and a reason to look for meaning in the data in a, in a way that somebody who is just interested in the science wouldn't necessarily do that. Um, and on a personal level, I've, I've always bounced between the two things. I've never felt like um, I could cope with the open-endedness of science. I mean, there's just so much to know about everything. Um, but when I'm in the medical world, I also think, how did that work? I want to know how that works. I don't want to just sit here and do what we've always done for 40 years. So for me, it's the good, a good balance between the two things. I do think the two are complementary. Thank you. That's a really good answer. Did. Yeah, I tell you, that's pretty much exactly the same. I think it it gives you some focus. Your your medical career usually comes first for most people who end up doing science and medicine, and so it gives you some something to focus on. And often you have a sort of end end goal that might involve patients. They always talk about science, um, clinical science existing on this bench to bedside spectrum. So you can be working at the bench, as in really at the at the front end of science, um, maybe like Anna does in the wet lab. And then there's people who exist at the bedside, maybe um, recruiting patients to uh, use ex you know new treatments, novel treatments, experimental treatments to see if they work. And so I guess as a clinician scientist, you've got a little bit more freedom to exist somewhere on that spectrum from, the, um, and you can just work in the, on the bench, but yeah, I think sometimes you have a, something at the bedside in mind. That's a real variety probably as well in terms of the different things that you get to, to work on each day. Brilliant. So, I'm conscious of time and we've got a few minutes left. And so I'm gonna encourage if anybody has any questions about the challenge itself and participating in the challenge, do feel free to drop them in the chat. And while you're doing that, I'm gonna put a question to the panel, the panelists. What kind of card game would you like to see emerge from this challenge from the young people who are going to be participating? Or is there any particular interesting aspects of cells that you think the students might think about when they're coming up with their, their card game challenges? So I mentioned that I, I like to think of 
organs and building in 3D, something our game designer had said, which I had not even thought of, was that there are apparently some card games where you literally have to either make a structure in 2D flat or you have to build something from the cards. And I thought that was really interesting. That might be quite challenging, but. Great idea. Uh, I'm a big fan of deck builders, um, which is a type of card game mechanic where everyone starts with the same deck of cards and then uses the sort of um, plays those cards to have effects that then let them buy different cards. And then I'm, I'd be interested in like, you know, if you have a cell of this type and what other types of cells does it need around it to support it? So, you know, you're only going to be affected by having that cell if you have the supporting types and that kind of thing. Um, uh, so, yeah, but, but I'm a big fan of, of that particular mechanic. Um, I have an I, I had an idea, but I'm trying to find what is the name of that game in English because I just remember it's in French. But do you remember when you were young and you were picking like each uh, person from the family, like you wanted the father, you wanted the mother, the daughter, etc. So this kind of game actually could be quite suitable with the cells because you could organize them by cell types and with the stem cell that could be the parents, etc. So that could be a, an idea to kind of showing different families or different parts of the body and within these different cell types that are like the members of the family. I'm not sure I'm, I know that game. Alexi, I know you're a gamer. Have you, have you got a sense of which game that is? I was trying to place it. I don't I don't think I, uh, I think the, the closest thing I can think of is, uh, uh, is like the game of life or guess who or something. I, I just don't think I played that one unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, that's, it was like guess who something. I, uh, I ah, guess who's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. Like, I just couldn't recall like which name was it in English. Sorry. No, that's fantastic. No, I think that's a really good, good answer. Really good answer. Michael, any ideas? Well, I, I think having a, a sort of competitive game was uh, always uh, quite fun. So um, some sort of yeah, competitive element to it would be uh, would be good. Okay, so a bit of bit of rough and tumble, bit of competition. I like it. And Sid. Uh, well, you know, something top trumps like each of these cells have sort of special powers, don't they? So, um, yeah, maybe it's generating all these blood cells, or uh, being super strong or super smooth. I don't know. Maybe superheroes. I don't know. Really good. Thank you so much. We have a we have a question about the challenge, so I'm going to throw this to to Dominic and, and Ellie. And um, if we if we were to send in a slightly outdated entry, would it be possible to take the entry back, update it, and then resend it? Sorry, I can answer. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I think you can enter twice. I mean, unless Dominic says otherwise, I don't. I think you can enter again. Like there's, you can keep uploading ideas to the website. So, if in a few weeks' time you want to upload another idea, then go for it. I think it's unlimited entries. Am I right, Dominic? Yes, that's one hundred percent correct. The more, the merrier. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, if, if you sometimes I get ideas when I'm just waking up with my eyes closed and I'm perfectly relaxed. I do find the the imagination, the ideas that flows, or when I'm when I'm in the shower. <laughs> I think of I think of games all the time or, or ideas all the time, and then just jot them down and quickly fill in the form and upload it to little to um, hca.littleinventors.org. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, do we have any more questions out there? We've got another few minutes before we sign off. Does anyone else have any questions on the panel? Oh, we do actually have um, Happy Families is the card game that Clarice was um, talking about. And I think Alexi has put a link to a Wikipedia page explaining 
the Happy Families game in the chat as well. So if you're interested in finding out more about that format for a game, you've got some information for you there. The, the old style Middle English uh, illustrations are, are gorgeous on that. Uh, yeah. Dominic, that's a that's a that's a nice way to end, actually, just in terms of of um, the fact that the the participants have to um, design up their card game box and then also the cards themselves. Have you any tips or tricks that they should consider when they're thinking about designing their card? Well, um, I think. Um... You need to, you need to, you need to, well, you've got two options. One, you can think of a game that already exists and then adapt that game. So that, so a number of the scientists have thought of that. Or you can completely come up with a bonkers, crazy game. There's no rules on that. Um, also, th you can think about, well, cards are this size, but maybe you wear the cards. Maybe you, maybe you have T-shirts and each person has a card on their front of the T-shirt. I'm just thinking out of the box here. Uh, maybe you've got hats with cards on them. You get those, those games where you put something on your head and, no, and, you, and no, you don't know what you are. So you've got to think, think um, yeah, either of existing games that you can adapt or you can maybe combine two different games together, which is always a good idea for inventing things. Like when I invented a um, maraca toothbrush, because you shake the maraca and you shake your teeth, you can brush your teeth and play music at the same time. That sort of thing where you connect two different things together can be really useful. Um, I think sometimes I'll write down lots of words. Just, just write down any words you can think about games, uh, the types of games you know, the types of rules you can, you know whether it's a two player or a, it could be a group game just write down lots of information and then i start drawing things even if they're not just ideas they're just just drawing the cards and maybe doing doodles and sometimes that triggers your imagination uh, you might you might make a mistake on a on a design on a drawing but that makes you think of oh we could do this instead or you know and also talk with your friends and colleagues i think just talking about it really helps the um, creative cogs turn, um, you know, having a good chat. And, um, and yeah, and then you've got three sheets. One's the box, one's the cards, and one is the, the, writing, the writing page, which, which sometimes, you know, people get ideas by just writing. Just, just sit down and tell the story of your game and start, even, even if you don't know what, how the game's gonna end, just start writing a story about a game. Um, and that might be another way into finding out about the game. Um, yes, yeah, so anyway, there's some thoughts. They're great thoughts. Thank you so much, Dominic. I'm just gonna launch a little poll to, to finish off here. Will you participate in our school's challenge participants? That would be really great to hear from you and while you're doing that I'm just going to say a huge thank you to all of our fantastic HCA members for coming in here today and giving us their time and sharing all of their wonderful wisdom about cells um, in this event today. I'd like to thank Anna Wilby clark Alexia Staffer, Laura Jardine, Sid Lawrence, Clarice Garnier and Michael Mather and I'd also like a big a big shout out to Dominic and Ellie from Little Inventors for joining us thank you so much for answering all of your great questions and I'd also like to thank M Dixon, Louise Walker and Luke Portis who have been behind the scenes helping make all of this happen and I'm seeing that with 10 people that we have in the room, we have 10 people, 100% who are going to join us for our challenge. And I'm absolutely delighted to see that. I look forward to seeing your ideas on our Human Cell Atlas.